Deep down, perhaps even people like me know that change happens and often it is good. After each service today and back in October and again this coming April and online and surveys, we're entering a conversation that is actually not new at all. That has happened at least, at least very large formal ways at least four times in our history and a thousand smaller conversa conversations in between about this house that we live in, our building and our grounds. In my office, I keep, oh, she's following me. I keep this picture of our old Universalist church downtown, one of three at 3rd Street and 3rd Avenue Southwest. This is our church that was built in 1916, at least dedicated in 1916. And if you come up after service, if you haven't seen this picture before in the hallways or in my office, you can see the congregation gathered out front in front of this church. I also keep this paper, the Rochester Daily Bulletin from Monday, June 26, 1916, on my shelf. It was in the walls of the House of Members Julie and Jeff Larson Keller when they opened it up for renovation, and they found this. It says, Grace Church, dedicated in an appropriate manner. And then it goes in to talk about all the leaders of the church, committee chairs, all the stops on the pipe organ. It's a beautiful thing. And it says, the new home of the Universalists of Rochester was planned with a view to respecting the sentiments of many of the older members of the body regarding the beauty of the old Grace Church. Because before this church in 1916, there was another church on 2nd and 2nd. Many of you know this, which is the current site of the Plummer Building of Mayo Clinic. So we had Grace Church standing there for 50 years, and before that, a little Universalist chapel before that. I keep these on my office shelf to remind me and remind us that we are part of a long lineage of over 150 years in this town that started long before any of us at least that I'm aware of. I don't think any of you are over 150. And it will last long past any of us or the children of our children, if we are lucky. It puts ministry, it puts programs, it puts forums and committee meetings and minutes and pledge drives and potlucks and classes and coffee and snow plowing and weeding. It puts that all in perspective and in a long arc of so many who have done this work for years. Some of it quite different now, some of it very much the same. It reminds me, these things remind me that we are living in the dreams that were just dreamed in that church, and that church was a dream of the church before. There were many others who dreamed to be where we are now and wondered what it would be. So I also keep this picture you may have seen this in the hallways or other places. This is Eliza Tupper Wilkes, minister here in the 1870s, one of the first women ordained in the United States, ordained here in Rochester in our congregation. And any time I get a little whiny or a little overwhelmed or think something's hard or is too, life and ministry is too busy or there's too many things to do, I can't check things off my list, she's just there on my shelf looking at me with her steady eyes saying, you think this is hard, buddy? <laughs> in the midst of patriarchal society and church culture, she puts me in my place, rightly, and I get back to work to carry on some of what she started, to be in the long arc of ministers and leaders who gave their lives to the flourishing of this place. I'll be honest with you. Now, I'm always honest with you when I speak up here, but. I'll be particularly honest with you today. This conversation about the future of our building and grounds of possible renovations or capital campaigns or even moving or whatever, wherever the conversation leads, it kind of terrifies me. Don't tell anybody. If I'm honest with myself, most of the time, I don't want to be like Emily Dickinson and dwell in possibility. I want to dwell in certainty. When I think about having to move things or change things or pack things for a little while or do some sort of construction or something like that, I think, my God, I just got my office set up the way I like it. 
the books and the plants, the desk, the chairs, the multi-daily adjustments of the window shades and the registers so that the temperature in my office only fluctuates by 20 degrees in a given day. I have it all figured out. I got my ties and my stoles hung nicely in this cute little closet in the corner. I figured out where to put the chocolate bowl so they don't melt in the afternoon sun through the thin glass. I finally figured out most of the functions on the copier. I found the key to that weird little door in the RE wing that leads to the boiler substation that looks like some magical little portal. And I got in there, it was just pipes, but it was still kind of magical. I can turn on the lights in the parking lot manually. I know how to get power to the exterior outlets. I mean, what else do you need to know? And sure, I haven't figured out exactly where I want to keep the pulpit on the floor or the chancel, but we're figuring that out, we'll get there. Deep down, there's a part of me that does not want to rearrange, reset, redo, re-anything. I plan to work in that office exactly how it's set up, either until you kick me out or I die. Not really. <laughs> but maybe, who knows, who knows? And that's the question, or at least that's the pesky little phrase, who knows? Who knows what our space might be like in 20 or 50 or another 150 years? Who knows? What will come next? We have changed buildings every 50 years or so, and we're just past that in this building now, which does not mean we need to leave, but it does mean we need to deeply consider our needs, our hopes, our dreams of what is possible. What sort of house and home, spiritual home, do we want to live in? Who knows what we don't even know we might be dreaming of? Unless we have the conversation, unless we get together with each other and have some thought or idea, some right question pops an idea in your mind for the first time that you didn't know you had, like kinetic energy, we create the conversation and the space together for what we hope for, what we dream and hope to live in, what is possible. Who knows what will come of our dreaming together? There are some things that we do know. We know that we have some deferred maintenance, the occasional roof leak in the sanctuary, either back there or up here, that is dutifully taken care of with shoveling of the ice on the roof and people who know that we need to take care of this in the long term, it's true. We know that we have some issues with cold rooms at the end of hallways and with a trusty, albeit old, boiler. We know that we have improved many things and poured sweat, tears, and blood into this place with intention and ingenuity and creativity, making things run well and shine, using the space the best we know how. And other times we lack adequate space for various events, multi-purpose space for community forums with modern needs for community meetings. We know our windows and cinder block and HVAC systems fall short of our environmental values. We know that our parking lot and steps in the multi-level building, while it has interest and creativity, also is not necessarily the best and most accessible thing to be in, right? And it was greatly improved by a million dollar campaign, but that was almost 20 years ago. And the conversation is still important. We know that sometimes we fill this sanctuary beyond being technically at safe capacity, like on Christmas Eve or for memorials or certain weddings. The commons downstairs can accommodate pretty good sized gatherings and make it a challenge though, not to host some of the larger gatherings, whether our services or rites of passages. We know for some this building feels safe and cozy like a home. For others, it can feel confining at times, wanting more light or open space or windows. And we know that needs change and opinions vary. And we take the stories that are part of our larger, longer story. And we take things from the old space like the candelabras or the chalice table or the red, red chairs down in the lobby. And we bring them wherever we end up. We bring those dreamed memories into our future and we figure out how to adapt and change and morph however small or great that we can, not by the container of our pocketbooks primarily, however that is important, but by the container of our imaginations, the container of our dreams, dreaming of what kinds of spaces we need to live more deeply into our mission and vision, to make the vibrancy that we feel when we're in this church be held well by the space, the best it can. Sometimes we can make any space more beautiful than we ever thought possible. And sometimes we can dream it into a new tangible reality as well. To allow for those intangible things 
that the building makes possible, love, justice, hope, spiritual growth, service, to grow even more. A container where we shift and we form together like kinetic sand into whatever space it is, knowing that it's the most important to stay together and to be mindful of our relationships in this space and to infuse the world with love and justice, to infuse our lives with meaning and joy and be reminded of why we come here at all to know that we are beloved, to be renewed for our call to justice in the world, a place to gather paradise. So here we read the stories of who we have been. We take our imaginations on wild rides anywhere, even out of Stearns County like a bookmobile, inviting us to journey with our ancestors, and the possibilities can open wide. Often when I think about this, I'm overwhelmed. What direction we might take? How do we balance our dreams of what could be with our gratitude for where we are now? Often hoping for clarity, I like to think that we're working in the realm of steel beams and cinder block, but life is just not like that 99% of the time. Life is always working with kinetic sand or a lava lamp, if you remember those, right? There are some edges, but within those general parameters, life shifts and moves and takes its shape by how we are creating community and life together. We change and grow, we hide or we run or we embrace each other based off our relationships and our interactions. Because you know that walk through my grandparents' house, an empty shell of what once was, I only told you part of the story. That's what we often all do, or sometimes that's all we can remember, just parts of the story. The other part is that I was hand in hand with my then two-year-old, Louisa, showing her this house for the last time, one that she had only been to a time or two long after grandma had died and would likely not remember, but she walked through like some beacon for the future of what yet might be. And it made me think about how maybe 60 years ago what, we, what I had remembered in this place was only a dream at that point, of what would make that house meaningful, of what would infuse those walls with story and family and moments of magic. And the other part of that story was that upstairs at the exact same time we were walking through, upstairs with hammers and nails and power tools, another young father and his father were renovating a very old, albeit I would say adorned with beautiful memories, bathroom, but still very dated, very old. This young father was now working at my grandparents' plumbing shop just up the road from the house. He also played the organ at my grandmother's funeral. He was a close friend of the family, and now he was moving into this house with his young children. In those swift movements and sound of hammer and nails and the sheetrock dust from upstairs, there was both demolition and creation. There was memory and there was possibility because I was wandering around in a journey of memories and he was creating a new home for his family to live in. And thank God he is still keeping the yellow linoleum in the kitchen, at least for a little while, so I can look at it nostalgically at his Facebook posts, knowing that that too in time will and should go. Because we are always on the threshold. We're always on the threshold in this life between what was and what is yet to be. We open doors and we let light shine in, in the words of Linda Susan Ulrich, bracing our shoulders against the weight of history, knocking rust off the hinges if we need to, opening the doors wide enough for sunlight to cross the threshold and give the dust something to dance about. We peek through a slice of possibility, name even the half-hidden truths, draw on the strength of the stones beneath us, ground ourselves in who we are, broaden our definition of neighbor, shine far beyond the lintel and sill, and pray that we become a gateway of love and compassion. That's all a church is for. Always between or within in-breath and out-breath, walking around in what was once a dream and is now a memory, falling apart and joining back together as community. If we're attentive, we know that we live in what was once a dream, and it is also our turn to be dream makers for the future with the hope and possibility and the courage 
and the humility that it takes to dream something into being that you know someday down the road will be a memory and to be okay with that. The hymn is number 140 in your gray hymnal. I invite you to rise in body or spirit. <clears throat> to join hands with those next to you or place your hand on your heart and breathe deep the breath of life. We are in the long arc of dreamers going back over 150 years. We're not at some end, smack dab in the middle of an arc going far beyond us. And as the conversation or the feelings or the memories get tangled and we're uncertain of where the future shall lead, there's Eliza staring right off the shelf saying, buck up, you can do it, and the world and you will be better for it. Amen. <laughs>